Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Omende. To continue with our series on the cerebrum, so um, I'll begin at the where we had left previously. So we were discussing on the acute fasciculus, and we said that the acute fasciculus is a tract of white matter that connects the Broca's area to the Wernicke's area, and this goes this tract goes through the temporal lobe, parietal, and frontal lobe. Remember, the Broca's area is at the frontal lobe, the inferior frontal gyrus, while the Wernicke's area is on the parietal lobe at the supramarginal gyrus. So this connection between Broca's and Wernicke's area helps um, to coordinate a comprehensible speech because Broca's is for motor speech while Wernicke's is for um, sensory speech. So that just shows you the location of the acute fasciculus. So we have what we call conduction aphasia. Conduction aphasia is when both motor speech and sensory speech have been affected, and this is because of lesions or, um, at the acute fasciculus. So this shows you the lateral surface of the uh, left hemisphere. That's the Broca's area at the pars triangularis and pars opercularis, and that's the Wernicke's area at the supramarginal gyrus and part of the temporal lobe. So that connection is what we call the acute fascicular white matter tract. Again, that's the acute fascicular from Broca's area to the Wernicke's area. So frontal lobe, some aspect of parietal and occipital uh, and temporal lobe involvement. Then we'll discuss the occipital lobe. It's located deep to the occipital bone and usually separated from the parietal lobe by a parietal occipital sulcus, and this is viewed on the medial surface of the hemisphere. And uh, this parietal occipital sulcus forms a Y shape with the calcarine sulcus, as we had discussed before. And the calcarine sulcus divides the occipital lobe into a dorsal cuneus and a ventral lingual gyri. The calcarine sulcus um, again joins the parietal occipital sulcus in a Y shape formation. So this is your parietal occipital fissure that divides occipital from parietal lobe, and this is the calcarine sulcus that divides the ventral lingual from the dorsal cuneate gyri. Then the banks of the calcarine sulcus form the primary visual cortex, which is also called the striate cortex. And as you move away from the striate cortex, the neighboring cortex forms the secondary visual cortex, which is a psychovisual area. So again, that's your occipital lobe, that's the parietal lobe. So the primary visual um, cortex is at the banks of the calcarine sulcus, while the neighboring cortex forms the visual association cortex. The temporal lobe lies inferior to the lateral sulcus. So this is the lateral sulcus of Sylvius. Inferior to it is the temporal lobe. It's divided into three um, by superior and inferior temporal sulcus. So superior temporal sulcus there and inferior temporal sulcus. So you have three gyri, superior temporal gyrus, middle temporal gyrus, and the inferior, superior, middle, and inferior temporal gyrus. So the superior temporal gyrus has um, several oblique convolutions that form the transverse gyra of Herschel, which forms the primary auditory area. And remember, the temporal lobe is located deep to the temporal bone of the skull. Then, on the inferior aspect, we have the occipital temporal gyrus, and this um, has the parahippocampal gyrus that's the most medial, pro uh, with its most medial protrusion, which we call the ancus. And these are usually separated from the occipital temporal gyrus by a collateral sulcus. Then we have what we call the piriform lobe. The piriform lobe is a primary olfactory cortex that's made up of the rostral part of the parahippocampus gyrus, the ancus, and the lateral olfactory stria. So this is what we are discussing. This is the occipital temporal gyrus, all right? So it's separated from parahippocampus and ancus by the collateral sulcus. So this is the collateral sulcus, separates parahippocampus from the occipital temporal gyrus. And the medial extension of the parahippocampus is the ancus. So parahippocampus, ancus, and the lateral olfactory stria together form the piriform cortex, which is the primary olfactory cortex. Remember, this is your olfactory tract. 
divides into medial, a medial and lateral olfactory stria. So the lateral stria anchors and paripocampus from the piriform lobe, which is the primary olfactory um, cortex. So the functions of the olfactory lobe include, uh, we have the primary auditory center at the transverse gyra of Herschel on the superior temporal gyrus. The remaining cortex from the auditory association area then the parahippocampus is a component of the limbic system. Then we have olfactory and association olfactory cortex within the temporal lobe, as we have uh, already discussed, the anchors and the parahippocampus being involved. And then we also have the tertiary sensory association, especially for visual. So again, below the lateral uh, sulcus of sylvius, that's the temporal gyrus, and the superior temporal gyra is what uh, forms a primary or, uh, auditory center with the transverse gyra of Herschel. So just uh, to revise, what is A, B, C, D? So A is our central sulcus, B is our frontal lobe, that's parietal lobe, occipital lobe, we say this is a transverse fissure, the lateral fissure of sylvius, and that's a temporal lobe, okay? So A is central sulcus, B is frontal lobe, C is lateral fissure of sylvius, D is temporal lobe, E is the transverse fissure, F is the occipital lobe, and G is the parietal lobe. Again, so if this is our central sulcus, that's the precentral gyrus, which is primary motor, that is the postcentral gyrus, which is primary sensory area, all right, that's the broker's area at the past triangularis and past opacularis on the inferior frontal gyrus for motor speech. That's a lateral sulcus of sylvius with the superior temporal gyrus, which forms the primary auditory center at the transverse gyri of Herschel. All right, that's the orbital gyrus, the occipital lobe, that's the um, inferior parietal lobule with a supramarginal gyrus, which is a primary sensory, so it extends to this aspect. So primary, uh, sorry, uh, sensory speech area, that's primary sensory area, the postcentral gyrus, that's the superior parietal gyrus. So again, A is a primary motor at the precentral gyrus. B is Broca's area at the uh, pars triangularis and pars opacularis. C is the orbitofrontal cortex at the um, orbital gyrus. D is the primary olfactory um, cortex. Okay, remember, then E is the primary auditory uh, cortex at the transverse gyro of Herschel. F is the Wanike's area, the supramarginal gyrus. G is the primary visual cortex. We say the banks of calcarine sulcus. H is the visual association area the neighboring cortex, the primary visual cortex. I is the primary gustatory area, deep to the lateral sulcus towards the parietal lobe. We said the gustatory cortex is the insular, parainsular cortex. J is the somatosensory association cortex, and K is the primary somatosensory cortex, which is the primary sensory area at the postcentral gyrus of the parietal lobe. Homunculus generally is an inverted map of the cerebral cortex, and um, usually on both sensory and motor gyri, where the body is represented, and that's how it looks like. So the most sensitive parts that require fine control have larger representation. As you can see, the face and the hands have larger control, and then the upper limb is on the superior aspect, while the middle surface of the brain we have the representation of the lower limb. We call that the paracentral lobule. The parts of the um, pre-central and post-central gyrus on the middle surface of the hemisphere is the paracentral lobule where the lower limb is represented. So remember, inverted map of the body on the surface of the cerebral cortex is the homunculus, and parts of the body with fine and more sensitive movement occupy a, 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 have a larger representation of the cerebral cortex. So again, that's the homunculus. So you can appreciate the paracentral lobule on the medial aspect of the brain where the lower limbs are represented. So we have various clinical um, correlates of the cerebral cortex. So lesions in the sensory association cortex uh, will lead to what you call agnosia. And this is where the general awareness of the general senses are affected. Then we have a stereognosia, which is hemineglect, 
where a person lacks the recognition of the opposite side of the body, then the visual association cortex uh, lesions can cause visual agnosia, whereby there will be disorientation and loss of coordination of eye movement. Bilateral lesions will cause prosopagnosia, where there is impaired recognition of previously known familiar faces. And lesions of the primary motor area can cause voluntary paralysis and spasticity of muscle. Remember, um, lesions of primary motor area will cause what you call upper motor neuronal lesions. Then we have apraxia, where you have impairment or in performance of learned movement. And in the absence of paralysis, when there is impairment that involves writing, we call that agraphia. Then we've talked about um, the speech areas. So if you have a lesion in the speech area, we call it aphasia. So in the sensory speech area, you get receptive aphasia. That's the Wernicke's area. Broca's area, which is motor speech, if you have a lesion there, gives you expressive aphasia. While lesion of the arcuate fibers that connect both Wernicke's and Broca's will give you global aphasia. Alexia is the loss of ability to read, and that can occur with or without aphasia. While dyslexia is incomplete alexia, where there is inability to read more than a few lines with understanding. So in the next lecture, we are going to discuss about the white matter. Thank you very much.